All right, greetings from the dark continent. Conscious Caracal here, or Adams Van Sale, here tonight to shine a light on the goings on down south. And joining me here tonight in that mission is uh, Gideon Yubar. You will recognize him from previous episodes. He's a friend of the show, often here on the channel. Also goes by Paratus or Guerrilla Media, on depending on which platform you follow him. And he's one of the leading responsible firearm ownership and and rights lobbyists in South Africa. And he's going to be talking to us about specifically the nature of totalitarianism in South Africa and how it relates to the crime phenomenon here and the different forms, how crime uh, is adapting in South Africa and how it has adapted over the years. Welcome on the show, Gideon. I'm looking forward to it. Ernst, uh, thank you so much for having me on again. And uh, to all the viewers and listeners, uh, good evening to you as well. And yeah, it's it's an interesting topic, this one tonight. And you and I kind of hashed this out. It wasn't quite around a, a, a bry fire, but it was it was cold, it was a social event, and it's something that's been sticking in my head, or rather sticking in my head for a while. And I think the picture became sort of clear around about two or three weeks ago about more or less what we're dealing with. So yeah, uh, mm. looking forward to unpacking this a bit. Yeah, and the the big advantage for my audience when I have a press conference that day means I'm I'm doing my uh, my show that night in my suit and tie, so that's a nice uh, nice little bonus for you in regards to uh, me just looking uh, proper. <laughs> so, uh, Gideon, let's start off with the theme of tonight's show. I've touched on it, um, but it's something. It's a question that you would think is obvious, but a lot of people don't make always make the connection. That's the connection between totalitarianism, which you are you immediately your mind goes to government. But then also crime and how those two uh, interlink and how they how they're related. Now, don't just answer it because all politicians are criminals, because then the, the show would be very, very abrupt, uh, have a very abrupt end. Um, can you sketch the picture there for us? How do those two concepts connect specifically uh, using South Africa as an example? So uh, actually, I can't tell you all politicians are criminals, but a great <laughs> many of them are. And this is where it gets very interesting. So. When we look about totalitarianism and how, you know, the negative impacts on freedom, whether they're talking about freedom of association, freedom of expression, freedom of movement, uh, your constitutional rights, be it your right to life, your right to own property, uh, your right to freedom and security of person, your right to dignity, all these things are negatively affected by any form of totalitarian regime in a society, in a nation, whatever we want to call it, the community, whatever. However, that said, as we usually, as you pointed out, assume automatically that totalitarianism originates from the government as an act, as a active process where the government and its appointed agents, whether that they are in a form of national security or whether they're in a form of paramilitaries or, or other political um, sort of actors attached to, to the brand of, of governing party, kind of use and abuse their power and, and their force projection in order to subjugate and subdue civil society in order for this regime to do what it wants. We don't quite have that in South Africa, and, and it's quite obvious why we don't, in the sense of any person who takes a look at our national security, sorry to miss silence, this, this is, I thought I did that, anyone who takes a look at our national security and safety infrastructure would immediately come to the conclusion that it's a complete mess. I mean, the South African Police Service, for the most part, has been incapable, uh, according to its own admission, of even fulfilling its constitutional mandate since the end of 2018, and probably for a good while longer than that. Crime intelligence is in complete disarray. Uh, you, you have areas where, you know, you have violent riots where more than 50 to 60 percent of the public order policing vehicles assigned to a, a precinct are unserviceable. So there's very little, if any, reaction. So from a policing perspective, uh, it's it's almost a, a nada. Then you look at the South African National Defense Force, which has recently been in the news again with the fact that they can't even keep track of their assets and that their spending and budget is so, I'm not going to say it's insufficient because it is It is kind of small, but they're squandering it on salaries for, I mean, th there was this joke that we have more generals than we have corporals, which isn't entirely untrue. And if you look at the fact that the average age of a rifleman, which would be uh, the equivalent rank of private, is 34 years old, and that's someone who should be 18 and 19 at average, uh, you're beginning to get an idea that the South African National Defense Force is really just kind of a retirement home for old MK and politically connected people that are otherwise unemployable. So they get 
sort of consumed by this machine called the defense force uh, that turns into a sheltered employment opportunity for them, even though they're not a value add. So uh, the government is going to struggle oppressing anyone by using the police or the defense force. It's not impossible. But it's Both of which they used uh, during the lockdowns, uh, incidentally. Mm. Uh, but I think that was really a case of the civil society being very compliant, extremely compliant, and really just letting them be bullied. So that's that's not really a massive concern for, for us as, okay, this big, powerful central government with this incredible muscle from a sort of state security perspective, all this infrastructure and resources capable of, you know, pushing us down. What is more concerning is a different way this is happening, and it is and it is in real time occurring as we sit here and have this conversation. It's the influence that organized crime, especially when it's politically connected, extremely well resourced, and uh, very prolific, can start having on you know not just a business environment and political environment, but also on. Um, on society itself. And I think uh, I'm going to go on a very long discussion on this. So I'm going to just shut up for a second and see if there's anything you want to interject there first. Uh, I just want to, you know, that's uh, that's exactly on the right path of where I wanted to go with uh, tonight's conversation. But I wanted to add there as well, what you're describing there, it all comes back to a, a myriad of factors, but they all come back to the, in Afrikaans, you'd say the, the verfall van die staat, the deterioration of the state. So even when, even if the state, the South African state, were to want to go totalitarian or were to want to go full Australia, they would not have the capacity to do so. Um, when it comes to, for example, as you described now, the police force and the military, even though in a, I think in a perfect world, if you were to give the ANC government just a, a snap of the fingers power where they can uh, pretty much mold South Africa in their image, they would ideally want a scenario where the police are pretty, uh, pretty strong and powerful and the military as well, so that they can have a full monopoly on security in, in, in every facet. But just due to the, their own deterioration, due to the, the deterioration of the South African government and its ca capacity and the destruction of government capacity, often by its own hand, um, there's a lot of space now for uh, private uh, initiatives to move in, for uh, uh, civilian-based initiatives when it comes to security to move in. Whether the government likes it or not, and I mean, like I said, this is not, I can guarantee you, this is not the ideal situation that the ANC government would have wanted, but it just doesn't have a choice. It's, it, like I said, it's almost in Shakespearean fashion by its own hand. It's uh, it's creating the very, it's sowing the very seeds of its uh, own irrelevance uh, as time ticks on, on a long enough time scale. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. And I think if you look at libera African liberation movements transitioning into governments, uh, I don't think ours is a tale on the continent that's particularly unique. Uh, the proof in the what the proof of the pudding is in the eating. And if you had to eat the South African creme brulee, you'd realize that it's about probably 90% sewage water straight from the, the Durban beaches. Um, there is really uh, no meaningful governance. It's all been misgovernance for the most part of, of the near three decades. These guys have transitioned from being uh, our supposed freedom fighters into being our, our government. And the the sheer state of things. I mean, anyone living in Johannesburg today can just kind of look at their situation and go, this is not what the city was 10, 15 years ago. It's not what it was five years ago. Uh, and the direct result, or the reason for that is this is a direct result of ANC governance. It's the same thing with the security structures. And the problem is, <clears throat> as those structures crumble and they erode and in some cases just outright collapse, it leaves a vacuum. And unless civil society or, you know, civilian structures fill that vacuum, if we, whether we're talking here about anything in particular, but let's refer to it from a security perspective, unless you're filling that vacuum, actively with with your own resources in order to do what the government is actually supposed to be doing so nature fills it with something else in the case of safety and security it tends to fill it with criminals right and and that's part of the reason why our violent crime rates are what they are is it's cheap to be violent in south africa i mean oh the last time i checked our conviction rates for murder was about 15 percent and the NPA goes, hang on, we we prosecute 75% of murder cases. And like, yeah, but the police only solve 19%. So 
So it means only about 15% of them go to jail. The, the rape's even worse. I think it's under 9%. And then when we're talking trio crimes, which is uh, vehicle hijackings, uh, robbery at residential premises and robbery at non-residential premises, the, the conviction rate was of like under 3%. So if you're a violent criminal, your chances of going to jail is very low, um, extremely low. So no, in South no, Africa, South crime Africa. does pay. <laughs> and and this is the other thing, you know. This is the other, something that really irritates me is when you see criminal analysts and uh, uh, people from institutions that go, you know, we we're safety and security analysts or crime analysts or whatever they're called, criminologists, and they say, you know, um, it's the poverty and inequality. You know, that's a major driver. I'm like, cool. You know, like I'm happy to admit that poverty and inequality. I'm not, I don't really care much about inequality. I don't think it's that important. But it does create a macro environment that, due to you know the nature of its existence, creates opportunities for crime. But it's not a primary driving factor. The people that are doing the most violent crimes out there are not particularly poor. I mean, the cash and transit the highest guys certainly aren't. Their skill is way too specialized. Uh, it's the same with the zama zamas. I mean, some of them might not be particularly well off, but the just way uh, just they... before you continue there for yeah. the international uh, listeners, just have to clarify: a zama zama is an illegal uh, mining uh, mining operation or mine worker uh, in South Africa, an illegal miner. Yeah, so th they're actually a really fun topic that I want to dive into because I think. Mm. Out of all the things we're going to touch on tonight, I think few as, as a single entity illustrate how badly the government has failed as as do the existence of Zama Zamas, because the Zama Zamas are like a multifaceted problem. So primarily, they tend to be foreign nationals, usually from Lesotho, um, but often from Mozambique, Zimbabwe and Botswana. They're all pretty much here illegally. So that tells you everything you need to know about the effectiveness of border control, home affairs, um, immigration control, all that sort of stuff, and internal policing and picking these guys up because they, they don't exist in isolation. They're sort of integrated with the local population, much like insurgents are integrated in local populations in, in the countries where they operate. So they already have failure. Then you look at the, the level of, of resources Zama Zama's command. So from arms and armaments, these guys have full auto AK type weapons that they got, get from somewhere. They have police issue and military issue R4, R5 type uh, assault rifles. Then they've got, I think there was a case where one of them got caught, but with a belt fed machine gun. And no, you mentioned this the, the last the time, last you, time were, you were, uh, the last time you were here on the show, you mentioned the fact that uh, that case, it was actually quite shocking. Uh, that, well, uh, that, happened. that happened. It, it is, but then you start going. Okay, they've got anti-tank weapons, probably as well as as well as hand grenades, and that's not a major surprise because anti-tank launchers and hand grenades are, are recovered in the Cape Flats on a almost weekly or monthly basis. So, I mean, the ISA NDF armories, whether it's a naval base or somewhere else, are just like leaking these things as if it's going out of fashion. Um, they might as well be opening a grocery store and just handing them out. Mm -hmm. So they're very well armed. They're here unlawfully. And then they conduct very sophisticated criminal operations where they are extracting this gold from disused mine shafts at great personal risk. So it must pay pretty damn well. Um, but now you've got the ore. Now what do you do with it? Now you need to refine the stuff. And this, inc this includes them getting a hold of, of, of another highly controlled item which is explosives so they do blasting uh they have the the knowledge the skills and the equipment to do blasting underground then they get the the ore back upstairs um they have it refined with facilities that they control and then they find uh, a market to sell it to so they're integrated into a very sophisticated organized criminal network where they 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 find sellers uh rather suppliers of equipment they find buyers of what they're selling so they, they there's interesting demand and supply uh relationships inherent to this they contract themselves out on the side these guys the zamazamas run protection rackets that's why the tavern shootings are a thing these so-called mass shootings at taverns almost all of them perpetrated by zamazamas um and they're doing it as a mafia style attack for economic gain that's the what specifically the economic gain is. I can't tell you because it will vary from incident to incident. But the tactic is 
is what it is. So they're running side hustles, protection rackets. They act as hitmen. Um, they act as escorts and guards for other criminal enterprises. And so, as you can see, there's different, there's diversification of skills that's happening. There's subcontracting that's happening. There's all sorts of um, sophisticated economic activity, as you'd almost see in corporate South Africa, like not, not underground, but above ground. And this is all happening. And then you start hearing stories uh, like in that report by Mark Shaw and his organization. I think it's um, Global Organization Against Transnational Crime or something like that. And he was talking about how in certain areas, entire police stations, including the station commander, are on Zama Zama payrolls. And they're acting as armed escorts for Zama Zama supply runs, as well as policemen acting as hitmen for them. Um, it's extensive. And this is why these guys have the capacity, how 150 of them can rock up, attack a mine, engage the mine's tactical team in a protracted firefight lasting many hours, where the police just kind of stand off to one side. Um, they have that type of force projection capacity. And the only way you get that powerful is if you have some sort of political connection in this country. Um, mm. but, but before we know, get to I... that, uh, that's going to be also another element. It's part of the, the title, the whole, uh, connecting the, the crime networks to the totalitarian nature of government. But uh, before we continue, I just want to answer a question here in chat from Ian Kloppers who says, um, we hear all these accurate findings and observations of the failed ANC ruling. What is the solution? That's definitely the right type of question to be asking, Inc. Um, and it's something I try my best on this channel to not just do diagno di diagnoses of the problem. I don't just do shows where we talk about, well, um, uh, this entire show, we're just going to be talking about how government is failing. Um, I always try to work in what is the solution. You'll you'll see uh, many of my the episodes on my channel are even titled things like solution building in a de-developing country. Um, but to answer your question in regards to tonight, seeing as I'm I'm assuming you're going to be watching till the end, we will absolutely be ending tonight's discussion on the way forward. So uh, first, the diagnos diagnosis of the problem, uh, and then uh, what is the way forward. So you can be looking forward to that. Uh, I promise you, we will be getting into solutions as well. This will not just be uh, pointing out the problems. Now, Gideon, on that on that uh, note, where we're still heavy in the diagnostics point of uh, of the conversation, you've now described. Firstly, before we get into the connection to government or to to uh, to oppressive government or totalitarianism, can you just again? You've touched on it now heavily, but I want to condense it again, put it under a microscope. The this whole idea of the criminal ecosystem. So. While you're describing that whole thing uh, in the previous uh, answer, I just kept thinking of a natural ecosystem where like the the one uh, type of bacteria uh, eats the algae and then the uh, bigger shrimp eat the bacteria and then the fish eat the shrimp and the it's just this big ecosystem but then there's also the, there's parasitic relationships but also symbiotic where for example you get like the those rhino uh, birds where they sit on the rhino and they eat all the lice from the rhino you get all these different symbiotic relationships as well and, and that's just while you were describing how these criminal networks operate i just kept thinking of the of natural ecosystems and how all these little parts and moving uh, moving parts fit into each other um can you uh, focus and elaborate a bit more again on that specific element the the criminal ecosystem that has developed and is still developing and adapting uh, in south africa so there's there's a lot to this so you know apart from w just remind me to talk to the taxi mafia later when we get to mm -hmm. the government part okay but we've got hijacking syndicates that specifically go after heavy goods vehicles and trucks so they go after the heavy goods vehicles hijack the truck uh with the purpose or the intention of selling the cargo so they've got they've got buyers for the cargo but what do they do with the truck and we found situations now where the trucks get smuggled across border to either Mozambique or Zimbabwe, where they're then sold and then used in the legitimate economy there, because those sort of government institutions have crumbled so far that you need to register the vehicle there. Or if you do register it, you can register it without someone asking too many questions as to, you know, where it's come from. So they send these trucks, these heavy goods vehicles, uh, empty after the cargo has been sold. It's a separate organization, a separate syndicate that is responsible for smuggling it across the border. They're not necessarily the same people that are involved 
in uh, hijacking the truck and they're not the same people involved in buying uh, the actual stock that's contained in it and then selling that forth, uh, that selling it onward further into the legitimate economy in ways. So that's already a semi-complex ecosystem. Then you combine that with stuff that uh, there's human trafficking going both ways, out of South Africa and into South Africa, and these track syndicates have a role to play with regards to moving the actual human cargo as well as they're moving the vehicle north and south. Then you start going, all right, but what's the role of um, the, the so-called illegal cigarette smugglers that are also interconnected into this, this, this sick ecosystem? And a lot of these other organizations, and a great one of, of symbiosis between rivals is the gangs. So... That whole guns to gang saga, uh, we only have seen the tip of the iceberg of the, the number of guns that the police sold to gangs. Chris Prinsler sold 9,000 by himself alone without his colleagues being involved that we know of. They, they sold firearms to the gangs on the Cape Flats to such a prolific degree that these guys started stockpiling them. And the, the secondary market for the stolen civilian guns from the government armories or rather the government uh, SAP-13 lockers became such a money spinner for them that they formed a price control cartel. So you have gangs like the Americans and the 28s, and um, there were a few other ones whose names escape me now. And these guys are, tend to be at each other's throat and the hard livings, and they, and they are actively out and busy with the turf war where they're trying to kill each other. They got together and they agreed to, to fix the price of these guns that they are then selling on to other gangs and to other criminal bodies. Uh, so they would meter and control the supply that they allow into the market at any given time. So they don't flood the market and the price decreases too much. They are making almost as much money out of their side business of selling guns to other criminals as they were from their primary market, which is drugs, mostly crystal meth. And well, obviously more higher tier drugs that they were selling into clubs where the protection rackets in Long Street come from and so on and so forth. But you get an idea of the level of sophistication and cooperation, even sometimes unwilling, but because there's a, a, a common benefit to this. So you've got gangsters selling guns to hitmen that are performing uh, either sometimes political assassinations, sometimes assassinations on behalf of taxi bosses, sometimes on behalf of Zamazamas, sometimes they're running escorts and protection for these other criminals, sometimes they're running protection rackets themselves. So it's a spider web of there are almost specializations and sub-specializations of criminal careers. And all of these things are intertwined in one way or the other. And the, the big difference is your competition isn't just someone who's necessarily making more money than you. Your competition is also someone that might be actively trying to kill you. As we've seen with Zamazamas killing each other, gangsters killing each other, the taxi mafia uh, and their route warfare, especially on the long distance routes in KZN in the Eastern Cape. Uh, and then their attacks on... Uh, into Cape buses, and then you get the construction mafia, which is its whole own thing, also, again, a politically connected thing, where you have ANC, and uh, there were rumors of a DA councillor being involved, but I couldn't get any uh, confirmation of that. But you have ANC and EFF councillors creating little community forums where there are big construction pro projects, and they hire in muscle from other criminal organizations to back them up to extort these guys for 30% of their project cost or tried to at least, which is why we saw that report of an entire uh, property developer group that basically gave up on KZN, I think, last week or, be, or, or over the yeah, weekend. Yeah, that's, that, that's, a, that's a fascinating phenomenon, the, the construction mafia. I've, I mean, I'm, maybe I'm not just reading, I'm not reading wide enough, but I've not seen other countries with a specific crime phenomenon like the, the construction mafia that you're describing there. Um, have, have you seen anything similar in, in other countries that parallel it, uh, Gideon? I haven't. Look, it's it's a it's a stereotypical extortion racket, right? But what made these guys particularly bold is there was that um, I can't remember the exact name of the act, but it means that if there's a government project, construction project, that thirty percent of that that project must, in some way or another, benefit the local economy, right? So what these guys did is any private sector organization building a mall in a township. They now rock up on the building site, hold the guys almost at gunpoint and say, well, if your project is worth X amount, where's our 60 million rand? That's the 30% that we want as representatives of the community. And it's like, well, that's 
firstly, not how the law works, ever worked or even says, and none of the stuff works, but that's how they've been doing it. And the problem is a lot of construction companies and property developers have actually entertained these guys to their own detriment, because the moment you do that, you set a precedent. The construction mafia started in KZN, probably connected to the RET faction and definitely connected to some of the taxi mafia associations. Uh, the biggest taxi mafia, by the way, being the Gitaba brothers, and uh, they're good friends with Becky Tsele and Jay-Z. <clears throat> and um, I think before we, we, we nail the construction mafia, let me just add some additional insight here. The taxi mafia um, is a complex organism. A lot of taxi bosses own their own security companies. Some of them are legitimate and they're registered. There's about 80 or 90 security companies in KZN that specifically do taxi related work. And it's mostly protecting ranks and protecting routes. Now, a lot of these guys, a significant number of those are not registered at all. They're not serial registered, they're not SAPS accredited, but they have section 20 licensed firearms uh, that they sign out to their security guards who for the most part on, on nothing else than uh, an army of, of taxi hitmen that are using fraudulent, well, licensed guns, fraudulently licensed because they buy the license from uh, their corrupt connections within the CFR and the, and the provincial SAPs. Um, and every time the regulators come to do inspections, they are threatened and forced to, to leave. And if they complain at the local police station, they get told to, to leave it alone um, because everyone's on these guys' payroll. So you've got a case now where you have a taxi mafia that have captured their regulatory authorities as well as that have key personnel inside critical elements of our firearm licensing infrastructure. And they can get a Without having accreditation, without having anything, they can get a licensed gun in two weeks that they then use for criminal purposes. And every time that happens, it, it, the, the media doesn't ask questions and they just assume that it, it's it's you know one of us that's that's to blame for it. So, and the reason they get away with it again, Ernst, is they have a political connection. The construction mafia is almost exactly the same thing. There's a very close connection and bond between what the taxi mafia are doing and how they operate and where they originate from in KZN and where how the construction mafia started in the same sort of areas and have now spread to Mpumalanga, Gauteng, uh, I think parts of Limpopo and uh, even into the, the trying to get a foothold in the Western Cape as well. Hmm. Well, uh, let's uh, let's start to moving in that direction with this uh, conversation. I think there was a there was actually a an opinion piece in the citizen the other day that said uh, the ANC, the ruling party of South Africa is the largest criminal syndicate in Africa. And uh, I'm, where's the lie? Um, when it comes to uh, the ANC's uh, approach to uh, fighting crime, fighting in very strong quotation marks, doing very heavy lifting. Um, when it comes to uh, the ANC's uh, relationship to crime, there's uh, there's two facets to it. Uh, firstly, there's the, the incapacity. So even if they wanted to deal with crime, then they, they're clearly not able to. So there's not a, there's not a, a way for they They don't have the capacity to do it. But then there's also the, the absence of will to do it when it comes to very specific crime, like, for example, government corruption. If the ANC, that's why the ANC is in, unable to tackle corruption. That's why the ANC is unable to hit back against corruption, because to tackle corruption would mean to tackle themselves. To hit back against corruption would mean to be hitting their own comrades. Um, that's the that's the nature of uh, of crime and corruption in South Africa. That's why there's no ANC politician behind bars for state capture. That's why the Zondu Commission, uh, in all likelihood, is going nowhere. Um, that's why uh, no Soroma Pozo can make every month for four years can make this very same promise of this is the end of corruption, nowhere to hide. Well, uh, it seems like the, the criminals have found out there's some type of cloaking uh, device uh, in the, the parliament building because they seem to be hiding there very well um, and they, they're unable to be found. So I don't know uh, how, the go, how the ANC is going to solve that conundrum. Um, but yeah, that's, that's, the, that's the nature of the ANC and their relationship to crime is that two-pronged uh, uh, perspective. 
there's the firstly the the one that's a little easier to understand and that is even if the will existed uh it, they would not be able to uh, tackle the the levels of crime that south africa has and then secondly but there's clearly also an indication that the world does not exist when it comes to specifically their own ranks they're sending a message to south africa the anc itself through its conduct they're sending a message that crime pays and uh, that's uh, that's uh, they, it's open season for criminals in South Africa. You just need the right connections. That's the message that they're sending through their actions, sometimes even through their own rhetoric. Um, it's a uh, it's a very it's clear as day that uh, the ANC is not um, uh, is not the the virtuous organization that they pretend to be. And I think that uh, that opinion piece in the Citizen actually nailed it with the the criminal syndicate label. It did indeed. And I think when you start looking at this picture of organized crime in South Africa and how it meshes almost seamlessly with the type of, of, of political connections it has, the ANC as an organization is bleeding into organized crime. Organized crime as an industry is bleeding into the very sort of uh, body of the ANC. And it's becoming very difficult to kind of part these two waters from each other. I mean, I don't even think Moses could do it. Um, you, you're sitting with, with it's the same uh, putrid sort of swamp. For, for, yeah, it's, for, like, it's, a, it's like trying to unscramble an omelette or turn an omelette back into eggs. Exactly. And if people forgive me the, 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 the Trump analogy, you know, it really is a, a swamp, uh, a soupy swamp of, of horrible criminal excess. And now, now you go, all right, so if the ANC is clearly, maybe not as a political organization, but certainly as, an, as a collective of individuals benefiting greatly from the, the negative security situation because of their heavy investment and involvement in crime and organized crime, those that are, and then those that have the connection, and for the most part, they don't seem to be too bothered with being directly associated with this this rogues gallery of scumbags. Uh, it's they, they openly meet with these people, they uh, associate with them, they fraternize with them. So there's definitely more than just a arm's length relationship there. Where this comes into the point of totalitarianism is the fact that if your government is not oppressing you directly by using its agents of the state in order to do its dirty work, but it can use its criminal elements for political assassination, rather its owned criminal elements, of, of which there might be a bloody army of the things by the looks of it. I mean, there are 100,000 gang members that we know of just in the Western Cape alone. That is, uh, I think I did the maths on it, that's one in every 25 men in, in the Cape is a, is a gangster. It's quite a few, um, or in Cape Town, rather. Um, if you look at, at the, the resources, the human resources at their disposal for assassination, for racketeering, for intimidation, there's been that rumor a long time that the CRT heists are funding Latuli House's bills. Uh, I don't think it's, it's necessarily true, but I wouldn't be surprised if, if some investigative journalist came out that, that it is true. They're probably heavily involved in illicit arms trafficking. All these things benefit them, and they are a massive threat to the public, to the taxpayer, to the innocent citizen. And in fact, in cases, are probably being actively weaponized against citizens and groups that, that are uh, politically undesirable. I mean, there's long been the theory that they're not all farm attacks, but and certainly a fair number of them, there is a political driver and a motivator for the groups that are doing what they're doing because they're not after they're not perpetrating these crimes for economic gain. And then you have to wonder, but isn't what's happening there? Is it a government hit squad, but it's a bunch of criminals, so they are mm. subcontracted for that particular purpose. Yeah, well, Gideon, now that you mention it, uh, there was a chilling revelation this Monday. And when I, me and uh, my colleague, uh, my Afri Forum colleague, Reiner Diebenacher, we went to the anti-farm murders protest in the Rutan, the Popo province. 
And uh, while we were there, we saw the, we caught a glimpse of the accused, uh, that uh, the accused murderer, farm murderers uh, that had appeared in court um, and they had been caught by community safety structures, again, emphasizing the importance of having those. Um, uh, while we're talking about uh, just the, the decay of the, the South African police force uh, connected to the government's own pattern of decay, um, something that would something chilling there happened, and that was when I saw one of the accused murderers wearing a vote ANC shirt. That was uh, that was something very disturbing to see, and uh, it, uh, it lends credence to what uh, what you've touched on there. That uh, there there is there obviously uh, is uh, cases where I think there's a strong case to be made that there's a, a political motive going on. And look, it's, it doesn't have to even be the entire ANC that's behind that there's a grand conspiracy. Mm. All you need is a handful of people in that party in whatever position of influence they are that are driving a specific agenda for their own benefit or for their own, uh, what shall we call it, um, whether it's for political reasons or for personal reasons or for economic reasons. All they have to do is use whatever is at their disposal and the networks that the ANC have and their criminal connections, and they are essentially perpetrating an ANC-originating or ANC-based uh, conspiracy against the public, and they're using criminals in order to uh, sort of achieve their goals, for want of a better word. When you start, you can really muddy the waters quite badly uh, in favor of, of this point when you start talking about criminal infiltration and the SAPs which has been an extensively documented problem. And I mean, the number of policemen that actually have criminal records and, and that like. Same with the criminal infiltration into other key uh, security and, 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 and government institutions. It's, um, it, it, you get a picture of just how bad the infection is. And sure, some of that might be a direct result. And, and I can guarantee you a, a great, a huge amount of it is a direct result of the, of the misgovernance and incompetence governance that we've had for about three decades. But another part of it is a deliberate infestation uh, for the gain of these specific individuals and to some degree, maybe for the party itself. Mm. Here's a very interesting comment. Um, no need, no need says, as an Angolan, I'm terrified by the level of organized crime of South Africa. Are the Safa Mafia the most powerful in Africa? Are they active in near countries? Um, that goes beyond my uh, uh, knowledge. Um, Gideon, do you have anything that you can enlighten uh, the, the listener there? I'm not 100% sure about who the Safa Mafia is, I, I, unless it's a South African. I think he's just talking about the South African Mafia. So I don't think there's a single South African Mafia. There's mm -hmm. a whole bunch of different ones. And they're not even a real mafia. They're, they're really just a bunch of common criminals and gangsters that have formed a loose and sometimes slightly more firmer confederations. But they do operate cross-border because they have uh, friendly organizations across border. And I do believe there have been cases that African criminals actually, much like the Nigerians, have their syndicates operating here. South Africans have their syndicates operating in neighboring countries as well. Um, when you start looking at the connection between organized crime and terrorist financing, it's almost a guarantee that organized crime in South, South Africa is somehow funding uh, terrorism in northern Mozambique. There, there is a connection there somewhere. How clear it is, you don't, you're not 100 percent sure. And then we have to confront the most probably uncomfortable one of it all, and this is now in the post July 2021 riot situation. What we saw there was probably the single biggest outbreak of mass criminality, looting and destruction, not just since 1994, but probably in the history of the country itself. Now, that, that we can blame the RET faction for this to some degree. Um, there, there was definitely a bit of political coordination there. But it, 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 it gives you a taste of what can be coordinated at a very short period of time by just weaponizing public anger and frustration and then combining opportunistic and well-planned criminal elements and integrating them into that chaos in order to do the most amount of damage. I mean, 
uh, there's lots of suspicious things that happened. I think Heidi Swart of the Daily Maverick, who's probably the only journalist there who I really like, and I've met her and I've had long conversations with her, and she really researches her stuff well, and for, as far as I can tell, without an agenda. And she did a great piece on on key things that went missing. Apart from uh, the million rounds of ammunition that I know about, I wasn't aware that two containers of AK-type rifles were also stolen from the harbor that weren't even destined for South Africa. Um, then there was communication infrastructure that was stolen and a whole bunch of other things that you would possibly steal if you were if you were planning some sort of a, uh, let's call, let, let's not do the January 6th thing and call the insurrection, but where you're, you're planning an organized and orchestrated campaign against the structures of state presently in existence, or if you just really want to wage war against uh, the general public in order for your own you know, for your own benefit. So that is a worrying element to it. And again, you cannot separate the fact that this wasn't done by special agents. You know, there's no uh, Zuma militia out there, but there are Zuma connected criminals who are just as good as a militia. And that's actually the whole point here. A lot of these maf mafias, uh, a lot of these organized criminal organizations have an army of people at their disposal. And it is, in effect, a criminal militia that can be weaponized against the public. Hmm. And yeah, uh, Giron, on that note, you were talking about actually, and this will relate. This will actually go back to that question from the the viewer about uh, cross border criminality. One of the 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 thumbnail that I used for the stream tonight is just all these AK type weapons that are laid out. That was part of a, a, a Zama Zama weapons bust, and just the other day. And I wanted to ask you if you have some uh, enlightening facts and information for us in regards to specifically the flow of weapons across the borders. Uh, is that the main way that uh, these criminal uh, elements are getting armed? Or is there also, uh, let's, let's rephrase rather, what are the main avenues of armament that these uh, criminal elements are getting their most high quality and most volatile weapons through and from? So it's a very difficult question to answer. I can tell you why. So the first thing is, we have absolutely no idea how many guns go missing out of SAP 13 evidence lockers on an annual basis. It is not reported on. The figure is not published anywhere. And when the police were asked about uh, quantities, they said it's impossible to, for them to tell that they would need to do an entire national audit. That would be an extensive operation to try and determine loss. So that oversight, by the way, that was the whole point of how Chris Prinsler got away with what he did and that entire uh, corrupt cabal that were smuggling guns from police custody into the hands of criminals managed to get away for it so long as because no one picked up on it because there was no, uh, nothing was being tracked. So the problem there is that it hasn't been fixed. Chris Prinsler wasn't the only guy doing it. Uh, Shaul Kinnear, who was supposedly investigating it, uh, got murdered. Uh, so that's probably still happening. So they're probably still there's probably still a industry of corrupt policemen with political connections that are protecting them, smuggling gang guns to criminals from police evidence stores and s selling them straight back onto the streets. So that's a, that's one problem. The second problem we have absolutely no idea about the Saps controlling their own armories, because about two years ago they stopped paying the service provider that kept central and electronic track of their weapons. They now have to keep track of those guns at station level on basically carbon paper. So good luck knowing where these things are circulating and where the ammunition is. And that is kind of illustrating the fact that uh, from 2016 to 2022, the SAPs allegedly lost nine and a half million rounds of ammunition. That's unaccounted for. They don't know where it is. I can promise you the SANDF isn't looking any better. There were stories like a decade ago where I think Jan Kempdorp, there's a massive um, armory or, or uh, sort of weapon equipment assembly area that was so unguarded, the fence was busy falling to pieces. And they were, ha they were saying it's an alarming problem for, for national security and public safety that they don't know how much of this equipment is going missing. So... From the state side, and this excludes government agencies that have their own guns like Praza, ESCOM, and that like, we don't know how many government guns are being just sold to criminals straight away. So that's one massive source. Mark Shaw mentioned in his book, Give Us More Guns, that the state is the single largest source of firearms for criminals. So 
I think that's one thing. The second thing is struggle era arms caches, whether talking Poputatswana and other homelands, whether talking stuff that was buried in KZN uh, with that uh, IFP ANC warfare going on until about the mid 90s, those caches still exist. Then the third one is cross border smuggling. And it's interesting. We, Zama Zamas, to the large part, some of the stuff they get, they are supplied with by contacts in the Lesotho Defense Force. We're just giving them weapons and ammunition and stuff. So there's stuff coming in from, from Lesotho. There's apparently stuff coming in from Zimbabwe and Mozambique still because there's a market here. There's stuff coming in via those countries from the Middle East. There was a story allegedly of weapons originating from Afghanistan being found in, in Hillbrow. Uh, and I mean, that was not long after the Yanks bailed there. So there's a very efficient black market at work here. And there was at least two stories I picked up on that I couldn't confirm. Let me put it this way. For all intents and purposes, I consider them to be confirmed. But I cannot confirm it to you sitting here. About a vessel that parked off the eastern coast of South Africa, allegedly transporting coal that we were importing, um, that allegedly offloaded a whole bunch of military-grade uh, munitions in KZN a few months ago. <clears throat> Obviously, without going into port, stuff just ended up there is it for for storage here is it for use in south africa is this stuff are we just a landing point and it's being smuggled into other african countries i don't know but the fact is that there is a silk road of arms and ammunition coming through south africa and ending here uh, apart from the state being a source so this whole business uh, uh, this of course is the, the cases where you don't have enough political connections like the taxi mafia where you just start a fake security company buy a gun and just get a fake, well, a fraudulent license for it in two weeks and just roll with that. So if you if you were a criminal and you wanted a gun, uh, like the country's your oyster. You, you just need to pick a source and then you're just going to argue price. So we have, yeah, we have a, a very sophisticated illicit arms sort of industry or, or mm. sector rather. Maybe those uh, maybe those uh, firearms from the Middle East were the ones that were traded for those Toyota Hiluxes that the, that ISIS were driving a few uh, that were hi hijacked here in South Africa that were driven by ISIS a few uh, a few years ago. Maybe that was part of the deal. Um, yeah, it's a it's a disturbing picture that you're you're sketching, uh, Gideon, and we could talk for another hour about. Uh, what's going on in South Africa in regards to the crime networks. But I did make a promise, but this is a, my, it's not just for this show and all my shows. Like I said, I try to get back to at the end to the solutions and how you, uh, how you approach uh, this problem or the, this broad crisis that you've described here. But let's start off firstly with uh, let's, let's dip our toes in the, the pool of solutions. And that is the response to crime in South Africa is clearly decentralizing. Can you now sketch a picture of, for us about what the good guys are doing as opposed to your 45 minutes of uh, sketching what the bad guys are doing? So the good guys are doing a lot. And I think AfriForum can also take a bow here. You guys have been very, very busy. And essentially, let's boil this down as simple as possible to brass tacks. Is there's a vacuum that's been left by this, the failing state security infrastructure and, and resources. That vacuum has been filled by criminals and there where it hasn't been filled civil society and civilian structures need to fill it with the aim of displacing criminals out of the areas that they've taken up and pushing them back we're never going to solve the problem of crime it's always going to exist but what we can do is we can reduce it we can contain it and we can make sure it's expensive we can make sure that there are consequences for violence um, and that doesn't mean vigilantism. I mean, the, the, this is a structured, rational, well thought through framework and approach that is efficient and, and workable and implementable. And it starts with something simple and small, like community based safety organizations. Um, neighborhood watches are vital for being community eyes and ears, being an active sort of patrolling deterrent. Um, being your, your tripwire, so to speak, for, for things going wrong and kind of trying to be first on scene and contain things. You can combine that with the professionalized security element of uh, quick reactors. I'm talking now about a specific community-based framework, for example. Um, you can do what the, the Jewish Community Safety Organization is and, and professionalize your volunteer corps and get them involved directly as, uh, as serial registered security officers for that organization 
but they're volunteers. They get issued their equipment when they are out on patrol. And you again, you, you start filling that space. And then you can start plugging additional skills and elements and resources into it. But it starts with, with someone taking the lead and organizing because it's wonderful to have all these elements. Unless they're being organized and directed and they are clear, there's a clear understanding of what the problem is in a community and what the objective is that need to be met in order to solve that problem. You're just throwing resources at a, at a thing and it's, and it's not going to achieve anything. Um, but when you have a community that takes its security safely, is a, it takes its security seriously and it starts actively getting involved in doing something about it, the, the moment you start having communities pop up around it that are doing the same thing, you can start developing links and cooperation and you can start throwing the walls out further of pertaining the areas that you are securing. And you can start going from, cool, I don't, I don't have a neighborhood or a street that I've secured. I now have an entire area. And soon the entire area becomes uh, a suburb or a fuerstad for, uh, there, there's no sufficient word in the English vocabulary for me that really substitutes oh. fuerstad. Okay, it's much bigger than a suburb. It's a, it's a, it's a whole like little town-sized section of a metro. Once you have that secure, you can link up with, with, with other areas that are doing the same thing. And this is all happening decentralized. There's no central authority that is directing these efforts because the people who know what needs to be done are ones at that local cluster level. And this is the beauty for me about the American system of policing that's federalized down to county level. Uh, it is very flexible. It's very efficient. It moves fast. It's not curtailed by big, large-scale corporate decision-making. But ultimately, it doesn't only just start with community. It starts with the individual. It starts with you, the person listening to this going, you know what? Am I going to dig a trench? Like like that wonderful conversation here not long ago, uh, and it's about the time is now to dig trenches. It really is. Uh, it's time to upskill yourself, take your safety and security, your personal safety and security seriously, the safety and security of your family, your neighbors, and then you start involving more people on the same mission as you in order to achieve it. And there are so many good resources and frameworks that cost nothing. And if you're really, really lost, I know that Afri Forum's neighborhood watch structure is actually a really good model. I've taken a look at it. I've seen what you guys have done. Um, it's not the only model out there, but it's one that I'm happy to endorse because I, I can see it actually works. So they must just get in touch with you or with Jacques or with whoever else is there if if they really have nothing and they want to start something. But it's it starts there. Yeah, well, uh, uh, it's it's simpler than just uh, getting in contact with us. You can just go to Afri Forum's website and to the Get Involved tab. And there you can see the nearest neighborhood watch to you. We have over 150 neighborhood watches all across the country. So there's bound to be one close to you unless you live in like Fergalia or somewhere like that. Um, when it comes to uh, there's a question here uh, that it's I think there, there's a lot to unpack here. But the question goes... It, it's a simple question with a complex answer. So can you give an example of an area that's already working? Well, that's going to depend on what you what you think about what would working be. Does, does that mean crime is completely eliminated? Does that mean that uh, uh, violent crime is eliminated? Does that mean that even up to petty crime is eliminated? I don't think you'll find any working uh, area in South Africa where every level of crime is eliminated. But there are many areas where the amount of crime that was committed there has been drastically reduced. Um, I, for example, immediately think of our oh, neighborhood watch in, uh, in the Muit area here in Pretoria that has had major successes. We've also had examples now of um, uh, specifically pertaining to farm murders, where th this year we've had uh, two uh, uh, two cases of uh, Afri Forum's farm patrols uh, uh, stopping farm attackers before a farm attack happened, and then other cases of farm attackers uh, that were caught afterwards again by community safety structures. So again, it all comes down to your question of what would you consider to be working. I would say working would be a visible and uh, a visible and obvious reduction in the level of crime of your community. Um, I don't think it is attainable to think that you're going to fix crime just like that and it's all going to be gone and you're just going to be living in a in the post-crime in a post-crime neighborhood. 
Um, but I think the what what for me, you you might have a different uh, uh, idea of what would be working. My stand would be that there's a clear a clear visible reduction in the amounts of violent and also petty and all smaller crimes happening in your neighborhood and your bigger area. Uh, that would be my my idea of working. Uh, Gideon, how would you uh, uh, approach this uh, this question? I really like that definition because um, I'm a big proponent of the old Pelian principles of policing, where you kind of focus on your metric for measuring police performance is not how many arrests they do or any other random statistic like that. It is, is, is there an absence of crime? Because if there's an absence of crime, whatever you're doing is effective and it's working. So if you're seeing a clear reduction in criminal activity, no matter how many call outs you do or how many responses you do or how many arrests you do, uh, the reduction in crime itself is an indicator that your your tactics and your strategy is effective. So I, I like that definition. Let's stick with that one. So areas that I'm aware of that have implemented a really good one. Now, this isn't something they've done recently. They have a very well-developed community safety structure is Milneton. They have a strong community policing forum that really sits on the Milneton police station's sort of head, for want of a better word. Uh, they have a good working relationship with their station commander, but they are very serious. Every year, they put together, in collaboration with their station commander, an extensive detailed community safety plan, and they make sure that the targets that they stipulate in it are met with the SAPs. Uh, otherwise, of course, they reserve a whole bunch of re options pertaining to, to getting the police back on track, and they use it. And in the worst case, they can litigate. And uh, I know Hope Bay did the same thing, which is the only reason probably that Hope Bay SAPS actually works today. So it starts with like a strong, very proactive community policing forum. You plug into that neighborhood watch structures. That are, that are then combined with private security as they are in Milnerton and the many cases where you guys operate as well, it works very effectively. But again, it involves local people volunteering their time and their passion and being goal oriented to address those, those concerns. If you have a, a chairman of a CPF that's not really interested in being there, doesn't really know what they're doing, you're not going to have an effective CPF. If you have a neighborhood watch, but no one's interested in patrolling, not going to have a very uh, effective neighborhood watch either. So you need buy-in from people into their own safety. So it's a mindset thing as much as a resource thing. In fact, the mindset might even be more important. Hmm. No, absolutely. And that's, uh, I think, a very important point uh, to make. Uh, as we're approaching the end, uh, I have one more uh, big uh, question for you, uh, Gideon, before we start wrapping up. And that is, what would be your call to action if you could, uh, the audience here listening here tonight, maybe some of them are itching to to do something, to get active, but they just don't quite have the direction that they need. Um, what would your call to action be to uh, to people that are that are listening here today that care about the uh, a significant reduction in the crime in their community and want to make a difference? What would you tell them? Well, the first place to start is to actually understand what you're dealing with in the area you're in. So get your local crime statistics, first things first. And you can get it from Crime Stats SA. Uh, I think you buy the, the entire stat printout for like 70 bucks. It's well worth looking at. It gives you a, a 10-year trend, essentially, of, of what's been going on so that you can become situationally aware as to what the reported crime trends are, as well as keeping an eye on your, your local newspapers and uh, social media groups. So you can get a feel if you don't already have that feel for what the local issues are, because you need to understand what you're dealing with before you can try and fix it, right? Because if your only tool is a hammer, all your problems look like nails and you end up fixing nothing. The second part is learn who's who in the zoo where you are. Who's your your the chairman of your local CPF? How often do they meet? What is the community safety plan? What are the terms and or, or rather the, the objects there of and, and how is it stipulated and is your local police station actually being kept to that community safety plan and forced to uh, uh, to successfully implement it? Or is it just no recourse? Is it just a paper tiger and, a, and an administrative exercise? Uh, that's a place, a really good place to get, become involved. Do you have a local neighborhood watch or commu so-called community improvement district? Who are the key people there? Do they take volunteers? What are their level of... Uh, uh, patrolling and, and human resources and like that's something to think about where you can add value there for example who's your local station commander 
get to know your local cops. Find out if they're people that, that you consider to be trustworthy or not, because there has to be at least one good cop for every, every bad cop there. Um, get to know the people. So the first thing is create situational awareness about your problem, your environment, the people, the role players in it, and then you can start developing a feel for where you can get directly involved. Because if absolutely everyone in your area is useless, then it means you have your work cut out for you and you need to start somewhere. Uh, and uh, there are numerous places where you can, but first you need to understand what you're dealing with. Hmm. No, I think that's uh, that's some solid advice, Gideon. And yeah, we've uh, we've reached the end now. I like this uh, this comment by Sideliner Opinions, who says, "I believe in the porcupine strategy: make yourself as inedible to criminals as possible." Absolutely, uh, we can talk about the the Eisterfark strategy. I think that's a, that's a nice way to put it: uh, make yourself uh, as uh, as undesirable and uh, make it as costly. You've mentioned this now, Gideon. Make crime uh, expensive. Make crime costly. Um, don't make it uh, make it pay. Um, uh, Gus Staliads says, uh, start small potholes, fix broken windows. That's another good approach where you start with the things that you can fix, the things that you can control. That's uh, that's also a very good point. Um, I see a uh, hint Klopper says, our local CPF is radio linked to SAPs and community security services. Very effective. The more community members have radios, the better effective it will be. We are the ears and eyes for the police. That's another very good point. Um, Let's see. Uh, uh, Arishna Nirmal says, uh, "Be your own first responder." Always. Uh, I think that's something you've uh, you've always been saying, Gideon. Yeah, it's my favorite catchphrase. There, there, catchphrase. Sorry, guys. Uh, Ari, thank you for bringing that up. Yep, you're always your first responder to your personal emergency. No one's coming to save you. Be prepared. Really, that's as simple as that. Yeah. Well. Uh, I think that's a that's the perfect uh, message to send. But Gideon, one last question. I, I always end my shows with this type of question. It's an open question, an open mic. And that is, if you were able to to leave the audience with some thought to chew on, something at the back of their mind that you'd like to plant there this week that's just going to bother them, they're going to continually, their mind's going to go back to it. Maybe Friday while they're, they're brying or doing something, they're just going to remember what you said. They're going to think about it. If you can implant an idea like that just for something for them to chew on, what would you what would you leave them with? I'm going to be a thief, a criminal myself, and I, I'm stealing this from Pro Professor Kurs Malan. And he said that the, the high walls that we build around our properties is actually a negotiation with the criminal element where we say, you know what, inside these walls, you're not allowed. But what happens outside of this is not my concern, and uh, you guys can have it. And he says, or he told me rather that, in his opinion, the approach should be is we need to throw the walls out, like make them bigger, and take back ownership of our communities from the, this criminal element, project our presence into them, be visible, be active, challenge people that that are, are up to no good and just be a visible strong tangible presence in those communities and and that's exactly what people are doing if they're members of uh, neighborhood watches and cpfs and they're projecting that presence into the streets and into the neighborhoods and communities but think about making throwing the walls out outside of your own property making them bigger and taking back that that space from a criminal element and where you can get involved to do exactly that. Hmm. No, Gideon, I think that's uh, that's the perfect way to end it. Uh, and I'd like to now just uh, thank you very much for your for your time here tonight. Thank you uh, for for sharing all your knowledge. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely uh, there's a reason you've become a regular on the channel. You always are a wealth of knowledge, uh, specifically in the the fields where you have a lot of experience and things that you've experienced firsthand, and things you've been reading about and listening to uh, other experts uh, in that same field. Um, Thank you very much. And I also want to thank the, the, the audience here tonight. Thank you for all your insightful, good questions. Thank you for all your, uh, your comments as well. They are, they're always nice to, to add here to the screen while we're talking. You, you're contributing to the content. Um, uh, so, yeah, thank you very much. And then also, if you're new to this channel, um, you can subscribe and you can uh, click like. Uh, well, anyone can click like if they like this type of uh, content. But then also, if you're new here, you can subscribe for more conversations like this. Gideon, where can people find you? Uh, where can I direct them? There is a link to your to uh, to your Twitter in your in the description. But uh, what else can where can they find you? 
They can also find me at uh, www.paratus.info, which is my website that I haven't contributed something on in, in about a month. I've been quite busy with a few projects. One, one of the people mentioned that I, I look tired and I am. I, I'm not, I'm not going to lie to you. I am bloody exhausted, my friend. I feel like I've just finished the Le Mans 24 hour race and I'm only about a third of the laps through. So there's a lot still to be done before Christmas. And um, I will definitely try and contribute a couple of more articles and then do a, 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 a podcast like this, Aaron Star, invaluable for me to try and get the message out of the stage. You've been mm. a huge help in, in having me on for these types of conversations. So equally, thank you for um, being a, a platform for me to, to have these, I think, very important discussions on. Mm. Well, Gideon, thank you very much. And yeah, I hope everyone has a, a great week ahead. Thank you again for tuning in. Remember, you can uh, also appreciate everyone that shares this content uh, all over social media with friends and family. Helps out a lot uh, uh, when it comes to getting this content and this message out there. So thank you again from the, the bottom of my heart. And then also, I don't, uh, I always forget to plug this, but you can also uh, follow me on my Telegram channel. There's a link in the description um, to be up to date on uh, not just uh, when, when I go live but also when new videos are uploaded when i write new opinion pieces and just uh, on the news in general that i think is um worth your time and worth your attention so cheers guys have a good one and god bless <laughs>